what are the best settings for this monitor? And by best settings, I mean the settings which I adopted in my review as my test settings. So they kept my colorimeter happy and allowed things to align with the targets I usually go for when I review monitors. Be aware that individual units and individual preferences will vary, so you can't expect these to be optimal in all cases. They are just a suggestion. So if you want to use VRR, make sure variable refresh rate is enabled. If you're one of those gamers who wants to use ELMB, you have to have variable refresh rate disabled and ELMB enabled, and you have to have the monitor running at 120 hertz. And I do appreciate some competitive gamers have no interest in either of those technologies, in which case you would leave both disabled. But for me, my personal preference is VRR, variable refresh rate enabled, and that will allow you to use adaptive sync, so AMD FreeSync, NVIDIA G-Sync compatible, and you can also use HDMI 2.1 VRR capability, which will allow you to use VRR on the PS5 and also with NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible. Next thing of interest, game visual. They're the presets of the monitor. I'd recommend either racing mode or user. So user mode and racing mode, you can configure them in the same way and they will look exactly the same. You've got full control that way and they don't apply any additional weird filters like some of these presets do. Of course, if you like how a particular preset looks, then feel free to use it. I do see a use case, for example, for the FPS mode. I'll come on to that a little bit later, but I'm going to be sticking to racing mode. And as I said, you could use user instead. So be aware that anything I don't mention in this video, I just keep it the default for racing mode. In image, I set brightness to 56. This gave around 160 nits on my unit, and that is the target I usually go for for consistency in my reviews. And it suits most of my lighting conditions when I'm using monitors, so that works for me. But please do adjust this according to your own preferences and lighting conditions. An associated setting is uniform brightness. I like to have that enabled because without it, you get a lot of aggressive ABL, automatic brightness limiter behavior, obvious shifts when you're on the desktop. And also when you're gaming, it looks kind of like you've got a kind of dynamic contrast setting enabled. And I never like that kind of setting. I know some people do. So again, this is according to your own preferences, but generally I would recommend leaving uniform brightness enabled. Everything else was left at default in image. Color. I like to use wide gamut. That allows me to assess monitors in my usual way using the full native gamut. And then I assess other emulation modes separately, such as sRGB. Some people might prefer to use sRGB for a more toned down look, which will be more appropriate to most content. But again, it comes down to personal preferences and what you really want the monitor to be doing. Color temp. In my case, setting this to user and setting red to 100, green to 96 and blue to 95. That allowed me to get close to my 6,500K white point target with a good neutral green channel. Individual units will vary, so these values won't necessarily work in your case, but they did on my unit. If you like low blue light settings with good balance and no green sort of tint or anything like that, so more of a warm amber tint, you could consider using the 4,000K setting because that's what that achieves. I also set gamma to 2.0, which actually got closer to the 2.2 curve overall on my unit. I explore this more in the review. So just to summarize again, variable refresh rate was enabled, game visual was set to racing mode, I changed the brightness to 56, made sure uniform brightness was enabled, and I made some changes to the color channels which applied on my unit and got things close to my 6500K and good neutral green channel targets. I've just enabled HDR in Windows. Settings are now very different, more restrictive. You can use VRR at the same time as HDR if you wish. A few of the Game Plus features are greyed out, but others are available to use. If you go to HDR setting and select brightness adjustable, then you can adjust the brightness. I like to do that and have the brightness set to 100, which will unlock the full brightness capabilities of the monitor under HDR. I explore this reasoning a bit more in the review, but basically, if you have it set to 90, I actually noticed a bit of undersaturation of some shades. Set to 100, there was a bit of oversaturation under HDR, but most people think they're going to prefer the oversaturation to the undersaturation. And of course, getting the higher brightness peaks is a nice thing, but please do try both and see which you prefer. If you notice things looking a bit odd with it set to 100, please leave it at the default of 90. If you find it too uncomfortably bright at either of these settings, then you can lower the brightness under HDR, and that's for viewing comfort reasons. Just be aware that the PQ curve of the monitor is optimized for 90. If you increase it to 100, there are some changes, which I mentioned earlier, related to that. If you reduce it below 90, things basically can look dimmer in general than they should. It doesn't just neatly remap things because you've lowered the brightness to a lower peak luminance or anything like that. That isn't how it works. So be aware of that.
So aside from that brightness adjustable, the main thing to be aware of, there are three different HDR settings in HDR setting, gaming HDR, cinema HDR, and console HDR. Game HDR is a good general out-of-the-box setting, which gives a nice dynamic HDR experience for a broad range of content, and it uses the maximum brightness capability of the monitor, so slightly above 1100 nits, if you have brightness set to 100. Now, this is my preferred setting, it's more consistent with most standard monitor HDR modes, so that's good for me to use in terms of apples to apples comparison in reviews. As always, some content provides better HDR implementation than others. And I'd recommend making use of any in-game or calibration sliders. And if you like, additional HDR calibration tools. As for Cinema HDR, well, that appears very similar to Game HDR, including on content I viewed on the PC using the Netflix app. It could potentially work better for some movie content, perhaps, but I'm not sure. I didn't observe any changes. As for the console HDR setting, that supports something called HGIG, or HGIG, which some PC and console games support, and that can improve the tone mapping accuracy based on the content itself, rather than using more generalised tone mapping. But it appears to be hard clipped to around 700 nits on this monitor. I've observed a similar kind of thing on other ASUS monitors with this setting. And HGIG relies on HDR calibration provided by the game's HDR calibration tool, system HDR calibration data on games consoles, or for PCs it can also use Windows HDR calibration tool data, if you've profiled using that. People generally find this provides a more dark biased representation, which some may find too dark. But on titles which implement it well, you should still get a huge amount of variety with a great array of medium shades and good highlight detail, at least up to the 700 nit or so limit I mentioned just before. So again, this is really going to be coming down to personal preferences. So if you particularly want HGIG support, console HDR might make sense. If you want a good general experience with full brightness potential, then game HDR with brightness set to 100. Back to STR now, I'm just going to go through some other things quickly. So. This is Legom, legom.nl, the website, and the black levels tests. Using my test settings, now this was an issue I did note in the review, even though I lowered gamma to 2.0, there was quite a bit of masking of these shades. It was even worse with gamma set to 2.2, incidentally. But the first row of blocks blends in very readily with the background, and the second row of blocks, up to perhaps eight or so, blends in readily. It's only really from block nine and above where you can see things distinctly. It shouldn't be like that. It's really because the gamma is too high for dark shades. So you could lower gamma further to 1.8. That doesn't really do a lot to alleviate things. It makes blocks 6, 7, and 8 a little bit more visible against the background, but really doesn't do an awful lot, and the top row still blends in very readily. There's also a shadow boost setting, which will boost visibility. Level 1 has quite a weak effect, at least for these shades which I'm observing here. Level 2 a bit stronger, level 3 stronger again. You need to go all the way up to dynamic adjustment, which will look at the content and make adjustments based on that for these particular shades where you get a proper uplift. But even then, the first row of blocks is not as distinct as it should be, and block 6 isn't really as distinct as it should be either. And that's even with the gamma still set to 1.8, which also has an effect. So this is where FPS mode comes in. So for maximum visibility, you'd want FPS mode enabled. The gamma is set to 2.0 by default, I believe. You can set that to 1.8 to lift up shades, and you can set shadow boost all the way to dynamic adjustment. And finally, with this setting, visibility is better. Um, even now, though, I mean, it's not the first few blocks aren't as distinct as they should be, and certainly as you'd expect with these kind of full-on dark detail enhancements which I've applied. So I've got FPS mode, camera as low as it can be, and shadow boost on dynamic adjustment. And even then, there's still some visibility issues. And the overall image in general looks horrible. It looks completely oversaturated in some respects, washed out in other respects, completely off. But if you do want the competitive edge of better visibility, and also increased saturation, which can give a sort of simpler look to enemies versus the environment and that kind of thing, and that can give a competitive edge, then this kind of combination of settings can be worth exploring. But for general purpose use and for games actually looking nice and that kind of thing, I'd recommend just sticking to my test settings instead. Or just seeing what works for you. I'm going to quickly go through the screen protection features which are found in system setup. First off, I would recommend disabling screensaver. If you have this enabled, it'll give you a vignetting effect where it will dim the corners of the screen in particular, just the edges of the screen a bit more generally and it can look really awkward and odd. Pixel cleaning, that isn't something which you have to manually run, although you can if you wish. 
What will happen is the monitor will just run that automatically after four hours of cumulative use if the monitor isn't being used, and that is to say it's allowed to go into a low power state and to standby. So the system has told the monitor to go to sleep or you've turned it off with the power button. If it's due to run its cycle, it will do that in the background. If you need to use the monitor, you can wake it up again and it will interrupt the cycle. I'll just try and do it next time. That's fine. The monitor annoyingly doesn't give any indication that it's actually running the cycle. So it's hard to know it actually is doing it. Usually monitors would have a sort of blinking at least of the power LED or something to indicate that it's running its cycle. But ASUS monitors, I've never seen them do that, this one included. But I have been assured that it does actually run the cycle. There's also a pixel cleaning reminder setting and that just gives a message on the screen after two, four or eight hours to remind you to run the cycle. I never leave my monitor on without letting it go on to standby for eight hours. So although I've got this set to eight hours, I never have actually seen the message. But if you do see this message and it annoys you, just have the reminder set to off. This doesn't affect how frequently it'll actually try and run the cycle. It just does that on the schedule I mentioned before. There's a screen move feature that is set to strong by default. And I find this fine. I didn't find it annoying. And what this does is there's an active area of an over provisioning of pixels around the image. And this will just move this image around in that active area. So up, down, left or right a little bit, a little bit of a displacement. It doesn't run off the edge of the screen or anything. So you don't lose any of the image when this is running. It's just an image retention mitigation measure. But if you do find it annoying, then just try a lower setting. And ultimately, if you find it annoying even on light for whatever reason, then you could turn it off if you really have to. Auto logo brightness, I like to turn that off for consistency in reviews. Generally using the monitor, you may not notice this having a negative effect, but what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to look at static elements on the screen and dim them a bit. It doesn't dim them massively. So as I said, you might not notice it and you might be able to just leave this enabled and that's fine. But I found that it does actually dim things like task bars and certain buttons that you might not necessarily want it to dim. 